Oh, they came for the 360 when the 360 came out, so it's earlier than that. Yeah. It came out on 2006. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh, this guy is, is bald, but he's too old for my character. God damn it. Let's see. I like Fallout 4 overall. It's just that... I don't know. I, I thought it was going to be my substitute for Skyrim, and I just keep playing Skyrim. Um, and I was like, I'll go back to Fallout eventually, and I never do. Yeah. Uh, with Skyrim, like I actually beat it, so it's like, well, I, I don't know. What's the point of me going back through like and doing well, all the same like locational quests I've already done? Well, like I don't feel like doing uh, Well, when I had my Xbox 360, I mm -hmm. I finished like the game, I think, <clears throat> four times. So. <laughs> oh, I have like a thousand items on PC and, uh, and many more on 360. Just... Because I don't do the main quest, I just do some other things. I get I get uh, mods and I don't know. I spend well, the time yeah, well, yeah, building like, homes and well, whatever. Like me on uh, well on The Witcher Three, like when uh, I was playing, I mostly focus on like the secondary mission to do like mm -hmm. all of them uh, in one place, then do the main quest. Yeah, right now the only reason like I haven't been Fallout Four is because I'm like. The main quest is four missions long, isn't it? Like, I did two missions, and I'm obviously at the halfway point of, like, oh, the blimp comes in, it's like, all right, stuff's heating up. I oh, gotta yeah, just back yeah. off, <laughs> or I'm gonna finish it before I even actually do anything. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. you're already far with the main mission. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think the problem with Fallout is that the story doesn't fit the gameplay. Like they wanted to recruit, they, I think they wanted to both. Uh, they wanted to fix some of the criticism they had got from Fallout Three. Like oh, I don't know the the uh, Brotherhood of Steel was too goody two shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, the, but at the same time they wanted to keep some of the things like oh the story was very personal, uh, and some criticism they got from New, from New Vegas, which is like, dude, that's the wrong thing to do. Don't. I mean, I know I'm in a minority here, but I am not someone who lo who liked New Vegas. I was like, mm -hmm. I, I was bored to death with New Vegas, and I was like, don't don't try to imitate that. You know, do your own thing. And I think had they, because they have a good setup, like they have the setup of the man who comes from the past, who has seen a vision of how the world was before. Uh, you know, uh, everything went to hell. And, and uh, depending on the character you choose, like he was a soldier that fought. And, in the war, yeah. yeah. Or a lawyer. Yeah, I think they could have just made both of them soldiers, but I guess they, that's a that's another mistake. They I made. guess like they wanted to at least preserve the idea that maybe you're role playing a individual of your choice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the thing is, and I found it very interesting, is that uh, they could have gone with that angle because they have the whole story with the settlements, right, and the building the settlements. Like, mm -hmm. why not make a story around? You're either trying to recreate the old world or create a new world, a different world, right? What I was thinking about, you're talking about Fallout 76? No, uh, Fallout just Fallout 4. 4. Just Fallout 4. But you know, I was thinking about Fallout 76 when they were just like, you know, they wanted the players to be the NPCs. Yeah. The whole game should have involved about what you said, creating settlements. And instead of everyone coming out of Fallout 76, there should have been several sh Fallout shelters in the map that everyone comes out of, and their job is to carve out territory on the map and create their own settlement around their bowl. That would have been the entire gameplay. They could have done that with a co-op or, or or versus mode on on Fallout 4. I mean, yeah, they didn't have to even make a new game about it. It was like, or like so. I've like uh, uh, well uh, made well a PvP zone. Like on the map, like there will be like a big red square, like called the red zone, and everyone in there could. Like PvP free, yeah. Actually, this no, I like someone's suggestion. They definitely should have had a co-op or PvP, and you pick which server you go to. If you want to yeah. do PvP combat, it should be its own server. If you want to do co-op, then that should be its own server. So, mm. but shoulda, woulda, coulda, but they didn't. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you're not, you're and not, it's not, obvious to me. Mm -hmm. Did you hear the last thing that came out about the developer room? 
uh, no. no. Yeah, I just recently watched something about that today. Uh, apparently, like, yeah. so apparently, um, I I knew this sort of tangentially because of the way software development works. But basically, like when you're developing the software, you basically put cheat tools in the software yeah. so you can circumvent a lot of just to test it, just to see like mm-hmm. if stuff works. So most game companies, when they're making the game, they make a little area or or a room or something where you can get like all the items in the game. Yeah, like, do, like, like on the Skyrim like every... one with the red oh yeah yeah room. I, I saw I saw that that news yeah I saw that and so yeah. supposedly not only did the Bethesda keep their developer room inside the live game but they just thought disabling the console commands would prevent anyone from accessing the developer room which apparently was two false assumptions and yep. so now not only were people getting into the room but apparently the room also contained all the all the basically unreleased Atom store content that they were test, I guess, testing out in the developer room <laughs> before they put it on the store. So people were taking those items for duplicating free, duplicating them because there was a duplication bug simultaneously in the game, and then subsequently paying, uh, posting them on like um, eBay to sell. Mm-hmm. And so, but the the underlying this is. In a typical game, you don't keep the developer room in there, especially on a multiplayer game, because you don't even want to give people the possibility of cheating that way. That's like mm-hmm. the last, that's the first thing you do before you release an online game. Like I've watched videos where people like break World of Warcraft and go outside the bounds of the game, and like their developer rooms are empty. There's nothing in there. There's like, yeah, this is obviously a place where developers are playing around with something, but all you see is like the wall textures, and that's it. Because they're smart enough to know, like, you need to take all that shit out of the game before you even release it, because that will automatically entice people to figure out how to do it. Hmm. Yeah, you what you do is you 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 basically create a clone of the server. There's two versions. There's the one you work on, and there's the one yeah. you release, which is isolated, and you play, work with it, and then you, and that's why you have betas because sometimes betas yeah. they, do, they, they do chunks and stuff like that. They're gonna test, you know, depending yeah. on what you're talking about. Some some people text chunks, but like that, just take a, a map. Some people do the whole thing for stress tests. There's a lot of testing and Q and A stuff that happens. You know, ultimately that means, and I know this because I've worked in several other software companies. There mm-hmm. is no fork. They are basically whatever they're working on. They just literally update and then they post it live. There is no intermediary testing version of the game. Whatever they're working on, they're testing on it and then they release it live with very just, little buffer yeah. in between their their proposed changes and the actual updates. So even a, a corruption, fa- uh, you know, a corruption of the data download could just screw them over so bad because that also also happens as well. A lot of times, just you know, you have a glitch, somebody I don't know, a uh, power fail, something like, oh, there you go. I worked for, work for a software company that did the exact same thing. They did this mobile application, mm-hmm. no project management, no development roadmap. Every it's a wild west cowboy. They decide what they want to work on. If they don't like what the boss is talking about, they'll sabotage it privately. You know what I'm saying? And so one day I'm sitting there, I'm two senior developers are talking, right? They spent this whole week working on this update. And they're like, oh, well, how are we gonna, how are we gonna release it? And they go, I oh, will just update it live on Friday and we'll go home. It sound, has a nice ring to it. Ouch. And the first thing I'm talking about, um, are you serious? You're gonna update the code live and then just go home and not come back till Monday? And sure enough, we come back Monday, the whole system was on fire. Because they had <laughs> never bothered to test the update. They just posted it live, literally, Walked out the office. That's what the does it. It's not That's the whole... Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know, this is a, I mean, mo- mobile development is a lot simpler, but in a grander scale, they're literally not even giving them enough, giving themselves enough time to test out whatever they're operating on. Mm. Like, it's ridiculous. And when I heard about that, I was like, really? And they literally, apparently, their only solution was to disable console commands. Uh-huh. And so it was like, wow, that's just really, I don't even know anymore what that company's doing. I think they want to cut, it's, it's a cut cutting measure, right? It's like, oh, we don't, we just want to do yeah. it. And... No, it's what? totally done for budgets and timeline. It's literally done on the, on the assumption that we don't, they don't need to spend that time because they're working with with what they consider to be off the shelf technology. Mm-hmm. You know, they're basically reusing most of the assets from Fallout 4. The creation engine for even with all the updates they're putting into is essentially 
uh, the same code they've been working on for over 10 years. I mean, you know, structure. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, people could use the same um, patches and the same mods for Fallout 4, for Fallout 76. That's how similar the two codes are. That just literally tells you how different the two games really aren't. Mm-hmm. It's that bad. And, it's, and, it's, it, it, you know what it is, is? I've been calling this for a long time. It's the it's peak patching culture. I mean, there's a lot of things that I know that, for example, you know, delivery schedules and live games, you need to have patches. But when you sort of get into the mindset of, like, we can throw something out there first and we'll fix it later. Oh, but that's what an even worse, has an even worse delusion. They've mm-hmm. been so, I, I want to say, they've been so spoiled by their fanatical modern community. Mm-hmm. Which I always cracked up because as an, I'm not a Bethesda fanboy. I've played a few Fallout games and I've fall, played a few Skyrim games, but I always looked at that modern Bethesda relationship as very strange because fundamentally, if you ever listen to how Bethesda talks about the modders, they don't consider them real developers. They don't consider them real partners. Those are mm-hmm. fans that are doing their little fan thing, and then the modders almost obsessively have this idea of you must work for free. You're not doing this for credit. You're not a real professional. You're just doing this as a fan. And I think that just created some sort of weird ideology inside Bethesda. Like, well, we don't have to worry about our bugs because some fan is going to fix it for us. And so they just took that out of the timeline schedules. They saw that as a cost cutting measure when they were selling it to the suits because they're like, oh, no, you know, normally we'd have to spend six months bug testing this thing. But, you know, uh, you know, but that's the Nexus is going to do that for us in a shorter period of time than we'll ever do. So let them do it. But there's you no know? way they can get away with that in a multiplayer game. So. I think that's the fundamental failure. Like when they conceived of this game, they were still falling back on the same assumptions that they were doing a typical Fallout game or typical Bethesda title, not realizing like, no, you realize like now that we don't have a modding community assigned to this game, those fixes are never going to happen. It's an abusive, re- it's, it's an abusive relationship. That's what it is, you know. And, and like I said, in a very real sense, not only has Bethesda invalidated and kind of like, I always felt like undermined its own modding community by literally implying, I've heard it several times that Bethesda developers say modders are not developers, modders don't work the way we do, you know, you don't get credit for being a modder, you shouldn't be doing this as a stepping stone to your career. Meanwhile, like, dude, if you can look it up online, there are people who are trying to recreate Morrowind using the Skyrim engine. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, if that's not development level work, I don't know what is. When you're literally trying to take Oblivion and look, make it look like Skyrim with the entire game available to you, there's a whole project that's literally trying to create the entirety of Tamriel that's on Elder Scroll Online using the Skyrim engine. You could go to Morrowind and Daggerfall and the Red Mountain and all the other places on the map that Bethesda refuses to go back to. They're literally creating a mass project where they're creating their own version. And I'm like, how is this not on the same level as a developer? And as Bethesda, I would have been like, let's buy these guys. Let's hire these people. Like, this is such a minor investment of money. All we need to do is give them a little bit of infrastructure and just a little bit of, like, sneak peek at what we do. And they just do their own thing. And it doesn't involve us risking huge departments and hiring manpower to let them do. Nope, they treat that as completely like that has nothing to do with us. And if they even think about trying to make money doing it, we're gonna you know, we're gonna stamp them out. You know what I'm saying? And I've always felt it's like a really strange kind of love hate relationship between the two of each other. Oh, but they're willing well willing to uh, put a creators club and sell their mods as yeah. Know. Their own mods, which is essentially the same shit that the modders did, now they want to pay for it. They want to charge for it. And it's like, I, what? I don't, that's, I've been looking at that for years and wondering, like, to me, I was like, it's simple. If someone's willing to spend hundreds of hours of their personal time improving your game, doing things that you're not willing to do, you'd, I would want to hire that person. Work closely with that kind of thing. That's the kind of person you want to have working for you, not treat them like, oh, no, you'll never be like us. I mean, that's how Valve got into the position it was, because they basically started hiring people uh, that were doing the work. You know, they took, yeah. uh, uh, you know, they, they signed. Uh, Pearl. Pearl's a they, perfect example. 
Coral was a bunch of colleges that took their physics engine and made their own game. And instead of Valve going crazy and suing them out of existence, like, no, we'll hire you guys. And they made Portal an official game. Yeah. The, the last, technically the last game Valve ever made. Uh-huh. They didn't make it, they published it. But that's a perfect example of how you can do something like that. You can literally look at the modern community and cherry pick the projects you feel are being handled by people who are want to treat it professionally. Fate that. I mean, you've got people who are fans of the game and technically savvy, willing to invest personal energy into improving your product. You can't ask for a better recruitment tool, but I've never seen it. I've never seen it expressed that way. It's always a, an almost antagonistic relationship. Yeah, well, I think it's it goes back to the sort of uh, 1990s, you know, many of these guys, at least the people who, who were, are later on, they're the guys who in the 1990s were the kids who were coming up and, and you're, you know, they're coming up and they were garage coders to get lucky. And it's like, oh, well, I can't have my own, you know, other people come up and do to me what I was doing to other people in a way, right? Um, uh, you know, it's like, oh, I... I won the war in Japan, so I'm going to take everybody's swords and I'm going to melt them to make a giant statue because I don't want someone else to come up with a sword and, you know, sword me the way I did everyone else. I can see that. It's not healthy. It's not good, especially when, you know, I, one of the reasons why I put thousands of hours on, uh, on, on over a thousand hours of Skyrim is because of the mods, you know, the entire market committee. Otherwise, I would have, have given it up. Like, there's no reason to keep playing, you know, on the PC at least. And I'm still playing vanilla because I haven't done this special edition because I don't really care about the upgraded graphics. I just want to play the game. Then. Well, I mean, I played Skyrim and I played Fallout 3. I didn't play Fallout 4 because honestly, I mean, I didn't hear or see anything that was like, well, is this is just like another version of Fallout 3, like ex- almost in the same tone. And, and like, I didn't see anything special about it, but... I played enough Skyrim to realize that there's a fundamental problem with the way Bethesda just designs their games. Because I think on the one hand, there was a business coming from both inside Bethesda and probably from their publisher who is literally telling them like, you have to make the game more accessible to normal people, people who are not willing to spend hundreds of hours going into the minutia of the game. And so Skyrim suffers from the problem of there's some really great ideas in Skyrim, but there's no structure. Yes, you can you can basically break the game story wise because you could be like a werewolf vampire who's the who's the professor of the mage college and imper- the imperial backs the imperial side and is an assassin. <laughs> Dark Brotherhood. You get what I'm saying? Like you could do all those quests in one run through, and by the end, you're like, my character doesn't make sense because they don't want to create a, a possibility of you yeah, must play the game singularly runs to come up with different branching options. You can do everything, you know. And I'm like, well, that doesn't quite work. And I mean, me personally, I hated Skyrim because I, I, I got to the end. You know, you beat all doing and, and you go to heaven and you fight with the ancestors of, of, of the Nords and it was epic. I go back to the real world and I talk to all the top NPC characters and they're just like, what's up? Hmm. Like yeah, nothing that's a, ever happened. That's a, there, there's a, there's a missing point there. It's like, Oh, I mean, literally you should become, I don't know, maybe the new emperor or something. You, can, you know, if, I mean, granted, I, I get part of the reason why they don't want to do that because Obviously, Elder Scrolls Six has to come out, and they don't want to have a. We must have the story be this way, which is fine. But like, I forget the main guy, the the biggest holding in Skyrim, the one in the middle, the one where you, where you help him catch a dragon. Yeah, that's a, his. Uh, yeah, I know. Right, right. His entire building was designed in the past to capture dragons. You figure it out. You help him catch a dragon. It's the first time anyone's caught a dragon in like a thousand years. You go back there after after stopping the world from ending, and he's just straight up as just, yo, what's up? Hmm. And I would be like, at least have a throwaway scene of like, hey, let's have a feast. Here comes the dragonborn, the guy who saved Skyrim and the world and helped me catch a dragon. You're the best guy I know. Let's be friends. You know what I'm saying? Like, none of that is in the game. And it's like, 
Wow. I mean, the 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 going to to Summon Guard is, I think, for me, one of the best endings in a video game because it's so epic, right? That part is epic. That's the part why. I, that's why I felt so disappointed because I was like, wow, after all this, like, mm-hmm. what are people going to say about me when I'm walking around? Scott? Nope. I'm just regular Joe Blow, like everyone else. It'd literally be like, oh, that's the dude who defeated the dragon. You know, that's the part I was like, wow, they couldn't even put that in the game. I remember in Fallout 3 at the end, right? You only have two choices. You either kill yourself or you convince someone to die in your stead. I remember I can't, because yeah, they all go, no, 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 no. I'm immune to radiation, but you got to go in there and kill you. It's your destiny. Uh, oh, no, but... you're not immune to radiation. I did an entire yeah, your run. Your companions of... are some of them are the super mutant one. Maybe, yeah, but, but uh... I did an entire run where I collected every rat away. I I found a special radiation suit that was like in one special part of the map. I literally looked around the entire map trying to find, buff myself. Took every possible radiation perk that I could think of taking. Got to the end and still died anyway. Yeah, but yep. if you uh, if you uh, bought the uh, DLC Broken Steel, at the end it, it show you that you didn't die. You just yeah, because yeah. otherwise they couldn't sell you the DLC. Yeah. But that's a problem. They yeah. sold you, they sold the you the real ending as as the a DLC. DLC. Yeah, the fix they the fix is like yeah, give me ten bucks and you can keep playing. What I didn't like about that ending because I I play very heroic character, so it's like sacrificing myself for that that exactly. wasn't really much of a problem. But what it did was that it, sl- it it slammed the door on the on the sandbox. Like, but I want to keep on playing. Well, you got to start from you know earlier save and ignore the story, or start from the beginning, which is like. But I want to keep me, playing. Was, exactly, and it, to me, it would have been just a simple thing of like, yeah, just create a condition where if a character wants to keep playing, create a condition that allows you to do that. Hey, you need a special radiation suit. If you go find a special radiation suit. You can play the ending. You won't die, and you continue on at the end. There's your option. People can decide to end the game early. People can decide to be a jerk off and convince someone else to sacrifice themselves or whatever. But it was such a like I was just like, wow, there really is no choice. You're gonna die or you're gonna force someone else to die. Which you're right. If you're playing a heroic character, I'm like, yeah, my character would never convince someone else to kill themselves. Like, so I had no choice. And once again, and after people say, oh, it, and the thing is that that epic moment. A lot of people say that uh, that they that they don't like Fallout Three because it doesn't it doesn't follow the the the, the flavor of Fallout Fallout Two. It's like, do you remember or even play the original Fallout Fallout Two? The Brotherhood of Steel was more or less heroic in the original Fallout, uh, although they could be jerks. You know, they had a, a dark side to them. Um, you could, uh, I mean, there were so many things. Like the whole story with the Vault, it's. Point by point, a remake of the story of the vault in the original Fallout, including the ending. Right? I'm like, okay, this. And to me, it felt very much like a return home. But and I, I, love, I love Fallout Three, but uh, it it certainly has its problems. And I never forgiven Bethesda for selling me the <laughs> for selling the, me the post the, the, the post game. <laughs> Uh, I feel like at this or, point, though, like they've cribbed off enough of the past that they don't have much left to go on unless they really innovate something interesting. And it feels unlikely, considering that they try to bring super mutants back in, like in a completely different area without immediate reasons. It's yeah. like, oh, okay. Well, they think, well, I don't they, know. They, they're they working on things they're, that like are Fallout to be there, rather than Fallout being about the different things that could happen in this kind of scenario. The problem, I mean, they have an they, they have an entire country, entire world to play with, and mm-hmm. they don't really do. When they yeah, do that, like, they do cool things because if you go to that uh, other DLC where you go to this marshy area and they have the the super mutants, especially the the rednecks that are almost impossible to kill, you know, with the super shotguns, that was pretty fun. And it's wacky, and it's like, wow, that's just, you know, it's like a, two two people are just, you know, killing each other, you know, um, who are just in this personal war, right? And this yeah, uh, yeah, weird I mean, cult. It's, that... it's been a war so long that they forget they forgot why you're fighting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, but the cool thing is, I mean, they're, they're supposed to be working on another IP, which is supposed to be original IP, which is uh, some kind of space game. But I don't know I how that. that. Yeah, I don't. Based on what's happening with seventy six, I don't know. I mean, is that going to be successful? Because they pissed off a lot 
uh, they piss off a lot of their goodwill. I mean, they built over the, the years. bottom line is if they keep the same design philosophy that they've been going on with these Fallout and Skyrim games, and they're going into Star Starfield with the same expectations, like oh, we don't have to focus on this, we don't have to worry about that, it's gonna crash and burn. I I think the I think they burned enough goodwill with Fallout Seven. I mean, the truth is, I've been hearing complaints even from Fallout Three because people have you know. Serious reviewers were like, yes, this game is buggy. Yes, some of it doesn't look right. But the single player story experience was such a unique thing at the time that people gave it a pass because at least you were like, well, this is something we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Now we're at literally the fourth version of a genre that now is flooded with examples, both good and bad, and how to do this type of game. I think the th biggest Thing that Bethesda got caught looking on was the fact that they kind of thought that they were the only game in town. Mm -hmm. So they thought that they were going to get a pass. Whereas, no, dude, you got CD Projekt Red, who basically showed you how to make a better Skyrim. You know, you, you, have, you got. You, uh, you, uh, I mean, technically, you want to look at a game like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, is essentially copied so many elements from Bethesda games that Assassin's Creed game anymore. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. It's uh, I mean, Horizon Zero Dawn was also awesome as well. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, and that's not a perfect game either. I certainly it was it certainly had its problems, but like the core fundamental, you could tell like yes, the core fundamental game they put a lot of thought energy into it. And once again, like to me, I feel the big problem right now is the suits want to make money, mm -hmm. don't want to risk investing in new technologies or new ideas because it's a risk. Why are we gonna sit here and spend five years working on a piece of technology that might not ever pay off for us where I can just pump this thing full of loot boxes and make money in six months? I think that's a huge problem in the industry. No one's paying attention to that. But accountants are now, I mean, you hear the CFO is now going into development meetings talking about we need to save money. And you're like, what? You guys are like printing money that doesn't make any sense and so part well, of the problem is make as much money as possible and be the most successful piece of media ever produced on the entire face of the planet but there's still failures quote unquote because yeah, exactly they don't continue producing money forever ad nauseum right and i think for example the biggest thing that's holding back especially in games like first person shooter rpg games is ai mechanics i think because you would have to spend at least five or six seven years alone working on a piece of ai technology that instead of it just being like every enemy is either a bullet sponge every enemy can dodge like i played destiny 2 i've been playing destiny 2 because i got it for free for ps plus after all the hoopla i'm like i've never actually played this game let me see what everyone is talking about and sure enough i'm playing this game and it's traditional strategy it's you know what it doesn't matter how well you shoot the enemy is always going to be able to dodge your bullets you can have the beat on the target you can be pegging him full of rounds and then randomly speaking he'll you he'll literally a lot of them literally just teleport left or right just so you can miss destiny of the ai in, in most of destiny is the so, enemies dodge or they're bullet sponges well, yeah, that's because it's it's an MMO, MMO light. That's what it is. Well, I that's don't cool. want I don't want to start the conversation, but maybe well, yeah. we could start. <laughs> now, let's, start, let's, start, let's start going before we go deeper into this rabbit hole. But well, yeah, well we we you kind of we kind of talk uh, for uh, twenty six yeah. minutes. No, I agree with you. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, fix up here. Here we go. All right, so. Let's start. And we will start at a nightclub. Okay. And so the, the setup of the story is um, Henrik is a major act, right? But he has recently been cut from his record label. So he is now currently without a, a, without a record deal. And so um, his publicist, who has decided to... Uh, remain working for him for free on the promise of future profits, because he believes in your music, um, has suggested that in, to keep you in the public eye and probably attract some other record label or at least some sort of project uh, that you perform a concert at this nightclub. Actually, I'm going to switch you over to the map. Which, you know, it will look familiar to everyone. 
<laughs> and so here you are. Um, it's a fairly crowded scene. There's a couple of uh, minor B-list celebrities who your publicist has managed to um, attract to the party. Mm -hmm. And um, corporate um, record label types are wandering around the crowd too. Mm -hmm. So your publicist has suggested that uh, you make sure that your security team is available because you don't, oh, want, yeah. any, you don't want any of these guys to get hurt. Um, well, I I know that my bodyguard Morte Morte is ready to fight if needed to. And so um, that's what your publicity. He's he's gotten a few people. There's a reporter, a major reporter mingling around the crowd. Um, he's trying to get to see if you get her to come do an interview with you at some point in the party. And so he's just like, yeah, you know, I know you like to throw them wild and crazy, Henrik, but this one's got to be. Um, Got to be a little bit safer than your normal ventures. Well, uh, well, me, I can say that I will be calm, but I can't promise those who will come. You, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that doesn't like me. That's true. That's true. But um, like I said, I'm just telling you, there's a bunch of guys out there you definitely want to keep safe. Oh, uh, let's see how the party is going to go. All right. So he's not there. He's actually he actually phoned in because he's, yeah. he's in the middle of something else. He's like, all right, you know, good luck with that. He's like, if you run into any stags, let me know. I got to make another phone call. I'm trying to see if I can get you some studio time to record a, another album. Sure, sure. And then he gets off. So the club announcer comes in. You're in the green room which is the lower right-hand corner. Uh, like this place? Yeah, that place right there. I guess I have my medic, well, my doctor, and I have a kitty too with me. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, kitty's back there. She's basically handling your live stream and, and handling your uh, social media presence. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's only been 12 attempts to completely take down the stream or uh, put up uh, terrible racist remarks live oh, on the feed this time. Oh, that's like a, that's like a record low. Yeah. And so the, 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 ba the backdrop is this. Um, you know, the record label dropped you unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. um, your fan, you know, you've, you've been kind of in hiding while you figure out what you're going to do. So your fans have been kind of anxious and this is literally your first public appearance since the breakup, quote unquote. Yeah. And so there is a lot of buzz about any kind of announcements that you're going to make or whether or not you're going to continue with your um, your guerrilla marketing reason why you and your record label broke up because, mm. you know, being a person who walks the walk and talks the talk, you actually film clips of yourself going into the, the crime zones and actually, you know, fighting off criminal gangs and <laughs> participating in mayhem. And so, um, and, and in the meantime, exposing the corruption and the hypocrisy of Night City, you know, being that there's the corporate elite and then there's everyone else who doesn't count. And so because of that, the record label was getting constant pressures from the corporate leaders that, mm -hmm. you know, you need to you need to get that Henrix back in line because he's not painting a good picture of Night City. And obviously, Henrik, you told them where you could take that suggestion. And so they drummed up some excuse and basically a uh, moral clause broke your contract. Mm -hmm. Oh. In, a, in a business without morals, you, you're, you have clauses on your contracts. Yeah. You, you broke the morality clause and in the moral corporate culture <laughs> because you broke the corporate morals. Well, <laughs> I, I can still do what I love and what I, when, what I want to do. So, but Yeah, that's why you didn't care. You're like, you know, you told, <laughs> everyone, to, you told everyone to kiss your ass and you walked out the, you walked out the office. So to here you are. Your first, your first appearance since that momentous event, the uh, while the record label did do you a solid, it didn't throw you under the bus. Um, the bigger corporate 
leaders of Night City have all been reveling in the fact that you've lost your Richard Record label. So there have been a lot of pundits on the TV saying, like, thank God that Degenerate Henrix is no longer corrupting our youth messages <laughs> on the TV. Heavy metal poisoning. Your yeah. children are getting it from music. Exactly. So you got a lot of Bill O'Reilly's uh, Rush Limbaugh types um, in the other half of the media sphere. A, you know, la languishing in their victory against uh, what they consider the the barbaric hordes at the gates. <laughs> Goddamn squares. Well, it's it's going to make Enric love because oh. they because they think they win, but I because but it's not over yet. All right. Well, it's it, well. Here's your chance because at this moment you get a knock on the door and uh, the outside bouncer comes in and says, um, Henrik, there's some uh, reporter lady named Alestra here to see you. Mm, sure. Sure. Uh, let in or in. All right. So he closes the door a couple seconds later. You see this woman walk in. Um, she's fairly short. She's, all, she's actually a tad bit below four, five feet tall. She's like four foot nine. Um, she's brown skin. Um, she has a rather moody look on her face, like kind of just like she don't want to really be here. And um, she has an angular face with a square jaw, a small nose, and ears that stick out. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has very well-groomed eyebrows. Okay. So, well, when she walk in and I, I say, well, take a seat. And she goes, well, thank you, know, thank you, Henrik. Um, my name is Alestra. I'm from. Uh, she mentions some some magazine, mm -hmm. publication. She goes, I was just uh, hoping to catch a few questions before you go live on stage. Mm -hmm, sure, go on. And so, um, uh, I was wondering if uh, you would like to uh, make a public comment about your recent uh, out of record contract cancellation. Oh. Well, mm -hmm. To be honest, it was to be expected for my action and all, but if, well, it was his choice to let me go, and I think it's safer for him to do that, but that's not going to stop me from continuing what I'm doing, combating the corruption and the organized crime. And I want to say that uh, I'm not against anyone. I just want to prove about the corruption that the corporate uh, corporate is doing, that they're using us for their own profit. I see. I see. So you you actually do believe that you're fighting for uh, for justice in the in the little man. Well, justice is one word. The truth is the other. Interesting. Interesting. What's your what's your uh, what's your comments on uh, accusation by your uh, your rival music band Deathbringer that uh, your so called live blogs are just a stunt? Well, I would I would like told them to come with me, but it would be dangerous for them, and I'm not sure if they're even going to come. You're going to continue making your uh, your your on your live blogs of your yeah nightly battles yeah always even Is if I a, die in them and uh, can you tell the public when we expect to see another uh... another mm -hmm. uh, you you cut there. Alestra uh, just says, uh, would you like to announce a potential release date for your next video? Mm, well, it depends on... I know it's going to be this month. Uh, maybe between two, two weeks or three weeks. Okay, okay. And uh, what... What do you have to say to your biggest uh, your biggest critics, especially in the corporate sector? You know, several of the more prominent leaders of Night City have literally decried your music and your message as being uh, subversive and uh, and against the public law and order. 
For example, Zayden Newcastle of Veracon LLC has been quoted as saying, Henrik is a throwback barbarian who wants to destroy everything we have saved in the last 20 years. Well, uh, first off, I want to thank them because uh, when talking about me, they're inciting people to well, search for info. And the more people that is incited to know about me, even if it's bad or good, uh, it's giving me publicity and maybe even new fans. And what do you have to say to the recent op-ed article by Elijah Drake, who is the CEO of Sessa.bit, he says, who says his image and lyrics are more akin to Genghis Khan than a freedom fighter? <laughs> um, well, my music doesn't, well, it doesn't suit with everyone. So if he doesn't like my music, just don't listen to it. I'm making my music because I love to do them. And I'm making it for those that doesn't have any, well, doesn't have any way to, to how can I say it, um, to, to enjoy life. Because I saw how it is in the combat zone and the corporate, uh, the corporate does have the money and, uh, and the arsenal to make those places well, protected and free, but they just stay on their uh, leather chair and just watch the world burn. Interesting, interesting. And so, and so you, you really do hold to the claim that you're, you're fighting for, for real, real values and, and to improve the lives of, of regular people. Everyone is equal, even if you're rich or poor, we live the same life. We are all born the same way. And so, and so what's your comment on uh, Alicia Prudence's uh, recent sermon? Uh, you know, she is the, the head of Tricon Corporation. She, goes, but she said, Henrik is a corrupting and dangerous influence on our youth. He contributes to the erosion of our values. This is a threat to decent society. You know, she has a large, she has a large spiritual following that, that follows her on social media. Well, um, to be honest, uh, I would like maybe to talk to her sometime, because if she has something to say to me, it would be nice if she told me face to face. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not gonna reject a chance to talk about the, about what I fight for and to express my will to do so. Interesting. Wow, that certainly was very enlightening. And then you see her, you know, she's got like a portable recorder, so she like flips it over to sell them. And she goes, "This is Alestra. This is Alestra Cunningham reporting in from you know whatever magazine she's coming. She's I don't have." Any time to come up with one um and, and she goes wow thank you you've got some uh, really interesting things uh you think perhaps you'd give me uh to release your video and make a great school uh, you got there what, what did you say uh, alestra the reporter asks you if you are willing to give her an advance warning on when you're about to release your video because that would be a big scoop for her, and you basically owe, she owe you a favor. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Henrik is going to rub uh, well his chin and say, "Oh, to be honest, I think." Well, and I jump in because I'm just standing there and listening to this and like, listen, love, this is, the thing is that uh, these operations are difficult and uh, very hectic kind of the moment. But if, I don't know, sorry to interrupt, Hendrik, uh, when yeah. he hits live and when it's hot, I'm sure he'll consider you. is not that right? But we never know. You have to go. When it happens, it happens. You know, it's quick moving. It happens. We do the thing. We fight. We record it. And it happens. So our life. Love is our life. So we can't really make a lot of promises. Perhaps what we can say is, and Hendrik is all you, of course, that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, when it hits its love, we'll give you a heads up. That's how probably we can, we can promise it. All right. That's great. 
you know, thanks, uh, thanks for taking the time and uh, break a leg. Or I hear you already break legs, so break more legs. And, uh, <laughs> and I fi- and I fixed them, but you know that's what it is. Yeah. It's not that sexy. Kind of bloody, actually. But yeah, well, uh, enjoy your time here, and I was happy to talk to you. Right, and with that, she leaves, and then uh, the the club owner peeks his head in and he goes, "Henry, you got five minutes." Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm getting ready. You need, hey, Hendrik, you need to uh, pick me up or something, you know, when you're going out there, you need, because I got, I got my specials right here, something right. to, you know, get you, get you going, you know, so it's a long, it's a long concert, you know, and you should still hydrate it, by the way, but this helps. Oh, yeah, well, uh, thanks enough, uh, Miguel, but I think uh, I'm going to do without it, no? I need to, well, stay, well, I'm kind of sober, and... And I need to to put a good image, because I know even I know there might be even some corporate uh, that, oh, some some corporate that paid some people to get into this place. So if we give them less reason to, <coughs> are you all right, Diego? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, yeah. If... No. Don't worry about it. Sorry, it's just I felt that uh, you know she, you she was already getting into your nerves. You know you were kind of getting tired. Your your mind was already jumping for the set. So I was like, jump in. But next time I keep my mouth shut. Don't worry about it. No, I'll do uh, my well, thing. Well, you you did good uh, jumping in, and thank you for that. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. And um, muerte, how are you doing? Um. He is going to look over at you, recognizing that you are talking to him, and pull a earplug out of his ear. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I was saying, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Uh, well, I'm doing good. I guess we kind of live worst. But yeah, well... Are you sure you can hear thing even with your air? Uh, your uh, uh, air bud? I'm sorry, can I what? <clears throat> Enric is going like, to clear his throat and say, Are you sure you like you can hear thing even with your earpiece? I don't need to hear anything. Alright. No. <laughs> well, you do you, huh? As long as you, you're able like, to kill people and protect me, you, you do what you want. I will do that up until it's proven that I cannot, and in which case you will not need to worry anymore. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to worry right now. <laughs> well, fortunately, I'm not paid to protect you, so it's not a worry you need to bother with. Kitty. All right, you get a you get a knock on the door, which is the signal that you're one minute. Oh, and Kitty, Stage. yeah, and Kitty, how are you? Are are you doing before I go to the stage? Just doing the work. Everything looks clear. Routing traffic uh, where it needs to go, and keep the malicious stuff out of the way. In fact, I think I've already pinged a couple punks for uh, some special presents. <clears throat> to to be honest, it can it cannot go worse than the last show with the uh, flashbang and all. Yeah, you know, once everything starts uh, setting on fire, it gets a little hard to pull back from that. Mm. But you know what? Best best of luck. Break a leg, set everything on fire. It'll be a good show. Go mm-hmm. out there, show. Uh, 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 Enric is going to uh, stand up. He's going to stretch, take his guitar, and he's going to start to make his way to uh, the stage. All right. So as you walk out to the to the main club area, you, it's the layout that you see there. Um, the tables are fairly jam packed with people sitting. There's a few people standing and milling about. Um, the turnout's fairly high. Um, like I said, it's been a few few weeks since you since the record, you know, since the split up. So this is people have been anticipating at least your fan base. Some of your hardcore fans are already standing at the front, um, at the front of the stage. Uh, they cheer, you know. They're all expectantly cheering for you, and um, and yeah, 
you go onto the stage and you begin your performance. So let's see how that works because I have to look at your character sheet and see if there's actually something you could do during this whole. Uh, well, I guess that would be like perform or. Uh, yes, performance. Uh, or there's a uh, uh, to do. Where is it? Uh, play instrument. Play instrument. Where is that under intelligence? Uh, technical. Technical. Tech skill. Technical. Play instruments. Okay. So, why don't you uh, make a make a play instrument check? Okay. All right, and so <laughs> I love that more thing. <laughs> and so, um, and so, yeah. As you get on stage, and your band, uh, you know, starts up behind you, you have an absolutely kick-ass opening. You know, your 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 typical opening walk on stage. I I forget what they put on entrance. Your grand entrance yeah. comes off without a pitch. Um, why don't you describe what you do uh, to get the crowd started? Uh, with the bit, a speech or something like that? Whatever, whatever your your opening. You know, I'm sure you've been to a concert. You know, most yeah, artists yeah. jump on stage and do oh. something to start. And uh, yeah, well, uh, Enric is going to go on stage. He's going to go near the mic and he's going to say, "Well, welcome everyone. I hope you're enjoying the drink, food." Or whatever you want to do here, everything well, everything for me is legal as long as you don't kill each other. That's all right. And I hope that you are all fighting for well, for for justice and fighting the corruption your own way, and even doing to a small uh, good action, helping your neighbor or. Even sending a small donation to those that trying to those in the combat zone, those with uh, well, those that lost their own and even some their family, will even if it's small, it's something great to do, and it's helping me too with uh, my my own battle against uh, the the corporation and. For all uh, crime organization. All right, and with that, your your diehard fans in the front give you a a generous cheer. Um, some of the people in the sitting in the back are also kind of yeah okay, and uh, you start your performance. Why don't you do actually? Why don't you roll a charismatic leadership? Okay. Uh -uh. Probably at this point, Kitty might like whisper into your earpiece, like, and don't forget to tell them to buy the merchandise. Well, <laughs> you cannot really risk fans at the moment. My t shirts, might... tell them they're on sale even though they're not. You might do that after he's finished. Okay, uh, 27. Oh, that's a wow! Yeah, and uh, you go your mic, uh, yeah, in and out. Hello, oh. Hello? Uh, yeah, Jesus, I I don't know what's going on with this computer. All right, you so, need the new well, mic. I need a no. I need a new setup. I need to wire in manually. I have it on Bluetooth, and yeah, my issues lying with. Okay, so let's go out to here. And da, 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 carry, well, 27, yes. So, yeah, with that, you have roused the crowd. Everyone has cheered loudly for you. You see a, a, a couple of shirts go down. <laughs> uh, and uh, oh, and uh, the music that is going to play is this one. Okay. Let's see what we got. Oh, yeah, that's right. You, you, Fantasy you rock me. and metal. Right. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So 
we'll we'll say that you're you're doing your opening act right now and then mm -hmm. the, so what are you doing griffin uh i'm basically keeping the stream up making sure that nobody does uh anything to take it down keeping an eye out for punks and of course uh using punks as targets for some of my hacker crew you know, okay. it, it's nice to route stuff through connections that uh, have nothing to do with their activities. And I get paid for it. Awesome. All right. So you're keeping an eye on that. Uh, Muerte, what are you doing? Keeping an eye on the um, crowd, exits, entrances, <laughs> etc. Awesome. All right. I'm and then... I'm near with you. You're trapping there with me. <laughs> That's Miguel, kind of... what are you doing? I'm just uh, pedaling, man. I'm just uh, looking for hot chicks who want fast action, with or without my with with or without my uh, my chemical. Uh, I'm looking for chicks who want a chemical romance. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, da, da, da. To be fair, though, Why if don't... your action is too fast, you probably also have a drug for that. I'm not the one <laughs> who's going to be taking them. Why don't you roll a streetwise check? Ah, I'm gonna fail horribly, but you know he thinks he's the shit. So, okay, let me see with my character. At. Okay, speedwise, personal. That's uh, I think that's a straight up um. That's a cool, cool right? That's a yeah. cool. You have a plus ten to that roll. Yeah. So it's a nineteen then. Wow, that's really weird. Well, you didn't. You have a uh, zero streetwise. Oh, it says yeah. you're five. Oh, I, I pressed. Uh, no, I press it cool directly because I don't. Uh, no, 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 just thought... hit streetwise. It'll do all the relative. Okay. For you. Okay, streetwise then. And plus ten, you said, right? No, you have to put plus ten. You just that's your your start. That streetwise is five. Your cool is five, so that you already get ten okay. on top okay. of your d ten. So once you hit streetwise, it'll just do it. Wow! Wait a minute. How did that work out? How can I get wow. four? Uh, it doesn't work out. No, yeah, it doesn't. No, it, that's weird. It says four. Uh, did you put something when it said the modifier field? Ah, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, because it's showing an empty spot, so it's clearly negated all the really? math by whatever yeah. you did. Okay, let me roll again. Again, it's like. Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. Just submit. Oh, that's better. There that's a go. crit. Yeah. Twenty. Yeah, that's a crit. Oh Jesus! What? <laughs> Action is good. Um, Hendrick's. Uh, Hendrick's opening uh, opening welcome has has energized the crowd, so everyone's all happy and business is business is good. You're getting a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of sales. Yeah. All right, uh, Muerte, why don't you make an awareness check? Okay, another good roll. So as you're scanning the crowd, um, so far the crowd seems relatively happy to be there. Um, you don't notice anything unusual. You do notice that there are now a couple of mosh pits starting to form up. People have moved the tables to the side so that people can have more space. And so um, that seems to be the most of where the uh, you know, aggressive activities are happening at the moment. And so um, everything's going cool. Um, we'll jump over to Kitty. So Kitty, as you're yeah. sitting there watching the live stream, like I said, the, the social media presence is pretty high at this point. Um, interest is pretty good. You managed to keep the, you know, the trolls and the flamers off the, the feeds and uh, highlight all the positive you know, comments for everyone and, and doing your little you know, social media gatekeeping. At the same I'm time, you're emote only chat. Right. And so, um, <laughs> and so, as you're scanning, you're also doing your own private thing. You know, doing your 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 hacker thing, and um, you're also any of the direct messages for Henrik and any kind of fan mail. 
And so as you're streaming, most of it is typical, like, oh, I'm so glad you're you're coming back. When's the next album coming? You know, I loved your video last week when you when you smashed that when you smashed that drug dealer in the face and um and, and whatnot. And then uh, you get an anonymous, it says it's an anonymous email, although the subject is titled with a fan name, you know, someone from the from the, the fan club, the, right. their, their handle. And the and it's obviously a Henrik fan because the the fan uh, the fan name is his name is um, I'm, I'm troll slayer and so his his fan his fan handle is troll slayer nine two nine two seven four.